record button if you see that pop up. Okay, so uh, we're now recording. Uh, so again, welcome to the workshop on residential battery storage. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, we wanted to walk you through the agenda and housekeeping for today. Again, we're happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Ellie Perry. I'm the Sustainability Director here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, I'll be serving as your moderator. We also have uh, our main presenters. So Uche, if you'd like to introduce yourself briefly. Thanks, Ellie. My name is Uche Siugo, uh, CEO of Infranergy. Andrew, go next. Yes, uh, hi everybody. I'm Andrew Dupree, Historic Officer in Fantasy. And then we have Kenny. Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> I'm, so not, I'm so new at this. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Kenny Seaton. I'm the Director of uh, Central Plan Operations Strategic Energy Projects here on the campus. Um, and uh, th these are also the people who will be speaking to you today. So uh, just to run through our agenda to give you a heads up on what we're planning to cover. Um, so again, I'll be moderating the session, uh, but we'll be starting off with Uche's presentation that will provide you with more of a technical overview of battery storage technology and its applications. Um, then Kenny will take, uh, uh, take a uh, turn at basically providing a case study on how this works on the ground. Um, and then Uche and I will be splitting a little bit, Uche doing most of the heavy lifting to talk about our uh, final financing options and programs uh, to be able to get battery storage at your facilities. Um, from there, we'll, we'll be trying to save about 10 to 15 minutes for, uh, for Q&A, um, where we'll turn off the recording and then you can ask any questions that come up. Uh, you're also welcome to throw them up in the chat and the Q&A uh, bar as well, um, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, in addition to that, we'll also be uh, launching our feedback survey while we have the Q&A, so you'll be able to do both simultaneously. Uh, so with that, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So Uche, uh, uh, again, feel free to just tell me quick click when you're ready to progress to uh, the next slide. Sure. Thank you, Ali. So again, my name is Uche Sugo with Infranergy. We are a um, battery energy storage and solar company um, specializing in deploying projects as, as well as the software that powers uh, these assets. And so we have a focus on uh, commercial, industrial, multifamily, as well as residential segments in the market. And uh, happy to be here today to talk through some of the innovations we're working on, as well as opportunities for, for financing. We'll go to the next slide. So just a, just a brief introduction on the company and what we do. So we focus on the ecosystem of solar and storage. So when you look at um, from um, community solar to commercial industrial solar um, to even other infrastructure that we can um, have deployed and connect to solar battery storage systems. Like when you think of EV charges as well, we focus on offering a full package of all the infrastructure as well as the software for keeping all that infrastructure optimized and harvesting value for you to help you save more money on your power bills. Um, Ellie, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, you know, we're as as part of this project, and we're partnered with um with CSUDH. We have an SBIR grant from the Department of Energy, and the, uh, part of this grant has really um, supported our development of a software platform to optimize energy usage. And how does that work? We'll talk about that today in more detail. And so we're a one stop shop to really um, be able to switch to solar, switch to storage, and get all the tools you need to really optimize your usage. Next slide. So just, uh, I guess, a brief introduction on battery storage. Um, you know, it really is um, supposed to help store your energy. And the reason why that's important is, be is because before battery storage, there was no way of storing electricity. So you had to consume it once it got generated, it got delivered and distribute it to your homes and then you consume that as a, and there was a seamless flow around that. But because of renewables uh, being intermittent and generating energy um, at odd times, either you know in the middle of the day with solar or more so at night with wind energy, storage helps balance the system by storing that energy and basically delivering it to you when you need it. And so um, in places like California, where now we have, have NEM 3.0, where if you put the energy that your solar panels generate, you put that on the grid, you get less money, less credit for that. And storage can help with that because you can store that energy and use it in the nighttime or 
during peak hours when energy prices are high, use your, your battery storage to really help you save money. And so being a store of that electricity is very important. Um, when you look at storage, you know, figuring out, you know, what works for you, it has to be customized to your exact use case and to your exact loads and your consumption. So some folks want to look at having a partial backup. Um, some folks want to have 24 hours worth of power. So it kind of depends on what your needs are and what you want and also your budget. The more, the larger your battery, the, the more expensive it, it is. So if you want to have um, 24 hours of power that that could be uh, fairly pricey compared to like a four hour um, you know capacity um, in terms of the different types of battery storage um, you know technologies lithium ion is the most important um, the pricing has dropped tremendously over the last 10 years and so we're at a we're at a tipping point where it's it's um, low cost and you can switch to this um, you know technology fairly quickly and also take advantage of, of financing and incentives rebates that are available today. Uh, given what uh, was passed the last couple of years, we have the investment, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act that really supports um, with, um, with some incentives that we're gonna talk about today. And let's go to the next slide. So in choosing your battery storage um, system, you know there are several different options available. We all know about Tesla, you know, folks like um, Solar Edge and other other battery storage um, OEMs out there, but you know, one, some of the main the main parameters to be aware of are, you know, what's how long does the battery last, right? You know, what's your use case for the battery? Um, you know, how many times are you charging and discharging the battery a day? And if you're gonna be off grid totally, which is a fairly rare thing, um, you can do that, but you might need a larger battery, and you might have to cycle you know, more often just to be off grid 24 seven. Not a lot of folks want to do that. Um, in terms of, you know, warranty, you want to be aware of the performance guarantees. You know, some companies would offer you um, to change your, change out your battery if there are any issues and they might have maintenance as well. You don't want to be maintaining your battery yourself or hiring a third party to do that. So that's an important um, consideration for, for choosing a battery supplier. What's their warranty? What's their um, maintenance policy? And also, if you're looking to increase your battery size in the future because you anticipate maybe you're expanding and you have you're going to have more loads, more air conditioning for a business or for your home, you want to have a battery that has the option to really increase that size seamlessly without having to reconnect and reinstall everything. So these are some of the important considerations. Let's go to the next slide. So there are several different uh, benefits of battery storage. I, we've alluded to some of them already. Um, you know, any decision you make for infrastructure has to be an economic decision. So you want to look at what are your cost savings and are you going to save money by, by getting this battery? Oftentimes, a battery could be because you want to have resilience. What resilience really means is if you're in a, in a, in a zone that has a lot of outages and a lot of blackouts from the, from the grid, at that point, it's not only an economic decision, but it's also you just need power. So, so that's also a consideration. Um, you can, you know, save money by um, peak shaving and load shifting. A battery makes you more flexible in terms of having your appliances and all your loads on the battery at different times in the day, where when prices are high from the grid. Um, and then you can also just have better operational ability if there's an outage. Now, the third thing is something that's fairly new, and this is a way to tap into the grid and put your energy back on the grid and make a lot more money that, than you once could. And so there are virtual power plant programs, and, and that's part of what we're developing at Infronigy, is a way to put the spare capacity of your battery back on the grid and put that energy back on the grid and earn money on it. And so this is an ecosystem whereby you can start you know, have having an automated way of actually making money and trading just the way you trade stocks, but this is more, more of an autopilot approach to putting your energy and getting the most value for it. Let's go to the next slide. So we'll we'll uh, try to dive into um, virtual power plants in more detail and I'll have Andrew uh, jump in here. Okay. Um, 
you know, looking at virtual power plants, as Uche said, this is you know, fairly new. You know, there are a lot of players that are really in this space now, both on the residential side and on the commercial side. But fundamentally, you know, what you're looking on this slide is the basic idea behind virtual power plants. On the left side, you have grid operators and energy exchanges that are really demanding that energy flexibility. And on the right side, you have things like the battery, you know, your EVs, you might have on-site solar, you might have a you know, smart thermostat like the Nest. And what you end up doing is by optimizing the dispatch of these assets on the right, you can really provide the necessary flexibility that enables you support the grid while earning revenue at the same time. So in summary, virtual power plants work by aggregating some of these distributed energy resources and controlling them to provide value to the grid while earning yourself revenue at the same time. So if we go to the next slide, we can kind of talk about some of the, the key areas where you, know, you would want to focus on and how that actually drives value. So from an understand VPP standpoint, that was what we were really trying to highlight on the prior slide, right? We're looking at decentralized energy resources that are working together to deliver that electricity and help balance the grid and supply that flexibility to your grid operators and the energy exchanges that are really looking for this flexibility. And how you're going to be able to do that, as we talked about, is via load shifting, where you could potentially use your battery storage to reduce the peak demand and consume power from the grid when it's the cheapest. You know, for those who have Nest thermostats today, I know we already see some incentives out there where they tell you if you were to drop your energy usage, you can get some credits back from the utility. You know, these are some of the incentives that are available right now on the HVAC side. On the battery side, you can do something very similar. And across all these distributed energy resources, you can do the same. So aggregating these distributed energy resources and moving your loads in a way where you're reducing the total cost that you're having to pay while providing that optionality and flexibility to grid operators and exchanges will enable you to generate a lot more revenue while minimizing your cost. Now, the last bucket here really is the incentive integration. And this is where, for example, knowing that you have a battery there are providers today that aggregate the different batteries, not just from one residential building, but from multiple residential buildings, commercial buildings, industrial buildings. And by aggregating all of these different loads into a single platform, create a virtual power plant where they can work with the grid operators, bring in the incentives from them that actually enable you shift your own load consumption, leveraging the distributed energy resources. And as Uche said, these are things that can really happen via autopilot, right? So it's not about, you know, you having to take a decision every time to say, okay, I'm going to move my usage at this point or that point. All of this happens automatically where by understanding exactly what your constraints are, you're really able to optimize your overall energy use, bring down your bill, while at the same time generate incremental revenue. As you go to the next slide, Ellie, I think this is where we start to talk about tactically you know, what this ends up meaning. So for you to really get these virtual power plants to work, there are a couple of things that really need to happen. One is you need to understand exactly the load profile. So here it means you need to predict the demand and the expected performance from the distributed energy resources. So for example, if you're someone that has an EV and you're coming back home, you need to charge your battery. Do you charge at that point in time? When exactly do you need that? you know, power to be put into your car? You know, could you wait until the next day? If you had a battery, when do you absolutely need it? You know, if you're going to be away from home and you're coming back later in the day, do you really need to keep your home at a particular temperature? So it's really understanding what is the exact use case from a demand profile within the building and are there any constraints around that? Now, once you understand that, it's about making sure that the actual tariff structure that you're on is mapped to your energy use, right? So Kenny will talk through you know, what that actually looks like from a case study standpoint. But what you would see typically is that the price of power is not the same in what every hour interval in the day. So understanding when is it the most pricey to get power from the grid? How does that overlay with the demand profile that you currently have? 
what does the constraints look like? You develop a model that brings all of that together and that enables you actually execute the optimal dispatch strategy to generate the additional revenues. So to really bring this all together, the VPPs allow you to generate revenue while supporting the grid and without significantly impacting the use of your own resources, right? The battery is still yours to control and use the way you want to. Your know, solar is still yours. If you have an EV, it's still yours. You know, all of these assets are yours. And the idea of the VPP is to enable you bring down your costs, generate incremental revenue without having to change the assets behavior, the behavior of the, the assets from a consumption standpoint. And that's pretty much it. I, I will pass it over to, to Kenny to really dive, us, dive into the, the case study. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, next slide. So forget about the numbers. What I want you to understand is that before you do batteries or solar or that kind of stuff, you need to understand what power you're using and when you're using it. So I encourage everybody, if you haven't done so already, if you're in Edison territory, you should download the Edison app so that you can see everything that's going on. Um, it tells you what your rate is, when you're using power, all of that different stuff. And this is all free available to you at any time that you can log in and see this. So here, here we're looking at the entire month of how much electricity in kilowatt hours is being used each day. Next slide. Here we're looking at one day. Now, what's important to understand is that if we look at off-peak, super off-peak and mid-peak, um, in my mind, the utility companies are confusing us a little bit because mid peak is really high peak, right? This is the worst time of the day. And if we look, that lines up with our four to nine o'clock window. So this would be the time you don't wanna charge your car. You wanna try and not run the air conditioning. Um, you don't wanna be blow drying your hair, that kind of stuff, right? Because that's when you're gonna pay the most for power. And I'll show you how much that is in a minute. And what's interesting is that it used to be in the middle of the night uh, was, was the cheapest time for power, but now if we look at our off peak, that's the middle of the night. So from nine o'clock in the evening until eight o'clock in the morning um, is when the second most uh, expensive time. And the cheapest time is actually in the daytime, eight o'clock until four o'clock. Why is it cheaper then? Because there's so much solar out there in the world now, right? So Greenhouse gas effect is less. Everything is great. They want you to use power during this time of the day. And so understanding when the power costs, what it costs, helps you to understand when you can discharge, charge, when you should be energy efficient, those kinds of things, because that can help you on how much battery do you need. Next slide, please. If you go online to Edison, you can find out exactly what you're paying for electricity. So and the rates just keep going up. Um, we're probably averaging 10% every year now increase. So in 2022, in the winter time, on the weekday, we were paying 59 cents from five to eight. Uh, some people are four to nine, and then they might pay a little bit uh, less, but then they pay more here. It's just, it's fun to decide what rate you want to do. But um, 34 cents is that time I told you in the daytime when the sun's out. And then at nighttime, we're at 39 cents. Weekends are the same or were the same for 2022. But then when we move into the summertime, it gets crazy, right? So when you're really using the air conditioning, it, go, it went up to 71 cents, 36 cents otherwise. The weekends, they give you a little bit of a break because they figure you're at home and you're probably using it. Next slide, please. This was 2023 rates, and there are more now again. Um, I think we were at 71, now we're at 74, so that's gone up a little bit. Um, all these numbers keep changing. And I was just on the phone with somebody, they said, oh, so every year I go, no, sometimes two or three times a year, you know? Um, the rates are constantly changing. Next slide, please. So, an Another view of a bill, this is probably my house with solar on it. And so, um, again, trying to figure out, you know, how, how can we reduce more often than not 
this is because of solar and some batteries that that were down here. Um, my bill cost was negative forty nine dollars. This was February to March, which means there was probably climate credit. Um, there are in Southern California area, we get two climate credits. One is like March and the other one is October. Um, so you'll get a break on your bill and it'll make it hard to figure out how much you used. Again, all of this stuff, you can go online and see exactly what your stuff is. Next slide. All right, this is one day and you can see that we used power from midnight until eight o'clock, the sun came out Batteries worked, so we used hardly anything. And so this makes the average usage 0.11 as opposed to point or as opposed to five or six or eleven for some people, right? It just keeps going up and up. Next slide. I'm not gonna go into all the math, but if you don't know how to figure out a kilowatt hour, you, you need to take the time to, to work on that. So all of your devices use watts. Um, LED bulbs, you know, they're three watts, five watts. Uh, before that, it was fluorescent, and they were 13 to 20. And before that, it was incandescent bulbs that were 60 to 120 watts, right? So the technology is getting better. We should all have LED bulbs by now, but some people still have, have the other stuff. Um, you know, if we keep it simple, then, you know, if you have a 100-watt bulb, um, and it burns for one hour, then it's 100 watts times an hour divided by a thousand gives us 0 0.01 kilowatt hours. And then we pay for the amount of kilowatt hours. So all those devices, if you start looking at, you know, what devices you have, when they burn, um, how many hours they burn, you can kind of get an idea of what that, that new device is going to cost you. Or for instance, what is that air conditioning cost that uses 4,000 watts and run, does it run for an hour during peak time or does it run for an hour during off peak time? Um, it's a huge difference. Next slide. Just another example of how to do the math for, for you guys to look at later. Again, this is all recorded so you can go back and look at this stuff. Next slide. Phantom loads. Um, phantom loads are a lot better now if you have all new appliances and stuff. But Ellie and I used to do, uh, still do sometimes um, a lecture for, for some of the freshman classes and stuff and talk about this stuff. And when we first created this back in 2015 um, at my house, I had a TV set and I had an Xbox hooked up to it. And I had a Nintendo hooked up to it. And I had a sur surround sound bar hooked up to it. I had a DVD player hooked up to it. All of that stuff was powered on 24 seven, whether I was watching TV or not. So without the TV turned on, that was 23 watts. And if we say that it runs 24 seven, that's 8,760 hours in a year. If we take that divide by a thousand, we get 201 kilowatt hours. And using a, a, um, a low number, 40 cents a kilowatt hour, that's $80 a year that, that I would be paying if I still had all that equipment. Um, back in 2015, I wanna say this number was about $27, which was the cost of a smart power strip. Smart power strip, you plug the TV into the, the main outlet, and if the TV's not on, then it doesn't supply power to any of the other devices. Or if you were to use a Google or Alexa or one of those applications, um, you could just turn everything off when you go to bed. And so that's a that's a good, you know, at my house, when I go to bed, I, I, I say, you know, Alexa, good night. And it turns everything off and my house goes down to 150 watts of power for the whole house as if the air conditioning and ceiling fans aren't running in the shoulder months like now. So there's things you can do that can reduce that so that when you start talking about batteries, how long can you last? Next slide. So we learn how to read the electric bill. That's great, but you know we're looking at yesterday or the day before that data. What if we wanna know what the live data is? So there are devices now, and this is, I, I checked this, this is the price. If you're in Southern California Edison territory, 
you can buy one of these devices for $40. You plug it into the wall, it's or a USB power, and it automatically grabs the signal from your meter that it's sending to the utility company. And it has all this cool software built in. So you pull it up on your phone and you can see what the power usage is per second. Um, you wanna know how much energy that toaster oven uses or how much the refrigerator is using or any of those things. You can just make them operate and, and, and watch this thing. It gives you trend data, it gives you all this stuff and it can help you make better decisions and build better habits, right? A lot of us, we're just tired. You know, somebody's always telling us, turn the lights off, turn the lights off. Well, why? Well, if you start looking at it, you'll know why. And then you'll know, okay, well, how big a battery do I need? Okay, so there's, this is one brand that you can just type into Amazon and find. Uh, next slide. That, that will read your whole house, okay? You can add some smart plugs to that. And now you can see what those individual devices are all the time. So how much is that, that portable AC unit or um, that, that entertainment center or your computer center or something like that, right? And so they work with this system, but you can buy others that, that are standalone. There are many, many, the prices come way down. I mean, this is $35 for four smart plugs that can tell you exactly how much power each one of those devices. And you can program them to go on and off at whatever time you want. You can talk to them, tell them good night. They, they go off. You can use them for your Christmas lights so that your outside lights aren't running 24-7. Um, you got to get control of the energy that you're using so that you can get smarter with the batteries. Next slide, please. A different brand, same exact concept, right? Uh, next slide. So you've, you've done the energy efficiency stuff. You've gotten your house down to where you think it is. So now you want to start, you know, finding some prices. Um, two reputable ones that I know people that have used. Uh, one is Pick My Solar and one is Energy Sage. And both of them have options for solar and batteries or either or. Um, fill out the survey and, you know, a dozen people will send over quotes that, that you can then reach out to later on and, and get into the, the fine print on that. A um, couple people here from Dominguez Hills have, have used this to, to add solar to their houses. Next slide. If, if you're super adventurous, you could do it yourself, right? You could go on Yelp and find yourself an electrician that got really good reviews. You could pull the permits and you can buy the equipment yourself. Uh, this is one brand, Franklin WH. Um, they make a whole house battery backup system that has a gateway that you just disconnect the power from the electric meter, plug it into this, back out to the electric meter, into the battery, your solar can come in. It makes everything work seamlessly. Um, that's one brand. Uh, next slide. EPQ panels battery kit. So this is another brand, sixteen thousand uh, dollars. Gets you a nineteen up to uh, actually this is a ten kW uh, battery system, which will take care of most people if you're living in a fifteen hundred square foot or less home. Um, next slide. There's some links to those. There's another system, EG4. So if you wanted to look at them and start you know, doing some research on your own before you talk to somebody, uh, of course, there's Tesla you know, Powerwall. Um, there's a lot of different systems out there now that you know, they've worked out the, the kinks and the bugs um, for when you're ready to do that. And then there's the, the financing options. Uh, there's the IRA financing options for residential, right? So you know, off the top, it's thirty percent. If you're if you buy a system that has a made in USA, it's another five percent on top of that, uh, ten percent on top of that, and uh, it it could it could be easier than you think. Next slide. I think we're done. Yep. And uh, as a note to everyone watching this, we will be emailing out the slides to everyone who registered. So you'll be able to uh, click on those links that uh, Kenny mentioned. So 
Um, so I guess with that, it's actually my turn. Uh, so how to actually pay for this technology, right? Um, so a couple of resources that are out there, um, just based on the like, utility, uh, we cover Southern California Edison, PG&E is very similar because they're all investor owned utilities. Um, but uh, here in Edison Territory, uh, they have a self-generation incentive program that is available to residential. Um, it is very much based on um, equity and equity resiliency, though. So there's a lot of criteria, right? Do you live in a disadvantaged community, according to the Enviro screen? Are you maybe a high fire risk? Um, have you had a lot of public safety power shutoffs in your area for more than twice in the last year? Um, are you on really important medical equipment that can't be shut down, right? Um, and so there's a lot of caveats with qualifying for this program, but they do offer it, right? So if you meet some of the, those thresholds, um, it's worth checking the, the matrix and seeing if, if you can get something out of it. Um, another resource that's more neutral in terms of it's actually Edison has its own marketplace uh, where vendors of this technology uh, can actually all post and provide uh, competitive pricing. They're plugged in with the utility. Um, so it's a good place to shop around and look for uh, this tech and see what, uh, what kind of options are out there and also finding uh, vendors who will work with the utilities and are capable of installing it as well. Um, and generally, the vendors will also know what the incentives are, or they they take a cut, right, um, to help bring down the cost of your uh, of your system. So that's a good place to look as well. Um, also, uh, another local res local ish resource is that there's a nonprofit in the area called Grid Alternatives. Um, so if you are in one of these qualifying SGIP areas, um, you can actually get a whole free solar and whole home battery uh, with Tesla Power Wall with all those utility incentives built in, and they'll do the install um, because again, they're a nonprofit and they're trying to bring this technology uh, to uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, so uh, definitely check, check them out and see if you qualify for their services as well. Um, and another thing, just before I pass it off to Uche, uh, who actually has a lot more on the federal side, um, another thing to think about is also, again, just uh, regardless of incentive, thinking about what you want out of a combination battery slash solar system, right? Um, so if you're in a situation where uh, maybe you really want to be not reliant on the grid when there's a power shutdown, right? Um, good example is that I have a mother-in-law in, in PG&E territory, and she's kind of out in the boonies, right? And then so there's constant power shutdowns, right? Um, if she has a solar and a battery storage system, that means that she can theoretically be able to continue to have power in those situations without being 100% reliant on the utility. Um, and uh, again, that's uh, that's kind of why the Edison uh, incentive for SGIP is like that, right? Because if you're in these high risk, fire risk areas, you get a lot of power shutdowns, um, you know, the batteries add a, a great deal of your resiliency to those types of events. So uh, that's mm -hmm. something to think about if that's really important to you uh, based on, you know, where you live and, and what your home situation is. Um, another thing to think about too, is that again, that pairing with solar, um, right? Because solar is less valuable than it used to be, right? You saw Kenny's graph about how solar is so much cheaper during the day because there's so much of it on the grid. Um, they don't really pay you to have solar um, in and of itself. So selling it back to the utility, if you even can, um, isn't really a, an economic feasibility thing. But if you pair that with solar, then you're benefiting yourself by being able to store that energy. Um, so all things to think about too, um, as you're kind of contemplating incentives and trying to figure out uh, what makes sense for you. Um, so I guess with that, I'll pass it off to Uche though, who can cover more of the federal and other local financing and incentives. So with that, I'll turn that over to him. Sure. Thanks, Ellie. So looking at the federal options, um, you know, because of the inflation Reduction Act, a lot of different options have emerged the last uh, year and a half, two years. Um, so there are home efficiency rebates, which allow you to do upgrades like install heat pumps and, and do some weatherization. And so these things help you reduce your energy um, consumption like, like um, Kenny was showing earlier. And so not only do you reduce your consumption, which is reducing your power bill, you can also install uh, solar and, and storage, right? Um, you know, LAHEAP is another program. It's the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Um, you know, that's focused on disadvantaged communities. So you find a lot of these um, incentives are focused on these communities because there has been a disproportionate um, clean energy adoption for the, the communities that have more resources. Um, DOE weatherization, this is from the Department of Energy. Again, it supports weatherization. Um, some of these programs even would support a roof repair. And so if you're combining some of these infrastructure upgrades, not only your energy efficiency and your solar panels and energy storage, you can also do other um, home upgrades as part of these, these, um, these big projects. 
And then another one is the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Act program. That's a new one that came out last year. And this one requires some um, key measurements around how much efficiency are you generating with the programs that you qualify for it. And there are some tools out there that support that. So um, a lot of information I know, but we can support by providing more and clarifying how, this, how all these things work. So the next slide, I, we should see a couple other examples. Now, investment tax credits are not new, but the IRA um, approved them to be extended out for about 10 more years. And this essentially gives you at least a 30% tax credit to offset your um, capital expenditure for actually buying your equipment. And so that's really, really um, a big incentive, probably the biggest, and this is nationwide, not just in not just in California. Depending on where you live, you can actually have additional tax credits, especially if you're in a disadvantaged community, up to about 50%. And so that would help offset how much you're paying for your um, your, so your storage and your solar. The IRA also just introduced storage having the tax credit, previously didn't have the tax credit. Uh, modified accelerated cost recovery system. This is essentially depreciation. And so if you're looking at, if you own a business or you're just doing your tax filing and you're trying to reduce your income, you can with, with depreciation and your account can help you account for um, for all this, we're obviously not, we don't give accounting advice, but this is a major um, rebate and benefit that helps offset what you're actually paying out for not only your um, installation, but also for your tax bill. And so we've looked at different incentives. Um, Ellie mentioned SCHIP. Another one is, is the SOMA program, which focuses on solar and um, incentivizes you to get solar at a cheaper rate. And so you basically get a discount on how much you're paying for the solar installation with the SOMA if you qualify. This is for um, multifamily um, you know, buildings because again, multifamily has not had a lot of solar and there are some um, you know, split incentives between the owner of the multifamily build building and also the tenants. And so this is something that if you live in a in the community, you can, you know you know, communicate this and talk to whether it's the owner or the landlord and figure out how that's, that could be installed at a cheaper rate with the with the incentive. Um, next slide. And so, you know, Infranogy really focuses on, you know, helping businesses, helping multifamily buildings to build in order to figure out their roadmap and how to switch to solar, switch to storage, um, take advantage of these incentives. And so it's really a tailored um, approach to customize solutions for them, um, figure out the strategy, what they're trying to achieve, and also provide ongoing support. And so we're, we're here to help. Happy to hear from you guys and feel free to reach out. And I think that's all we have today. And we can answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Um, so I guess with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so again, this will be available on our uh, CSUDH Sustainable YouTube channel uh, for future viewing uh, for anyone who missed it or wants to revisit any of the